So thanks for coming to class tonight. These are made possible thanks to grants that we get through the library and the Arts Council and all these different organizations. We are so grateful. So tonight we are going to be working on the love bear, which you can see here on my table. Oh, that's what I wanted to see if we could pin. Is it possible to pin my, let's see. That's me in spotlight. All right. So I think you should be able to see the bear really large right now. Thumbs up if that's what's going on for you. Okay. Careful with that thumb, Ruthann. <laughs> okay. So we are going to work on this love bear. And as you know, in my classes, if you decide you want to make something a little different, by all means, if you're going to make a kitty, then maybe you have some triangle ears, or if it's gonna look more like a koala, go for it. Um, but the, the things that I want us to play with tonight are layering. So see the heart is behind the paws here, right? Um, so some layering and using some negative um, shape shading in our background so instead of drawing in hearts and coloring in the hearts or whatever shape, if you want to do bubbles or stripes or triangles, um, little peace signs, which might be complicated, um, we're going to play with some negative shape um, painting or pastelling, I guess we could say. So this is our aim. Uh, I'm going to move this to the side and get uh, a new sheet of paper out. So I've got my new piece of paper. And, um, you know, I sometimes have people who come to class and say, oh gosh, I can't even draw a stick figure. And I say to you, well, that's just fine because um, we're not drawing stick figures. So don't worry about it. You know, people come to my sewing classes and say, I can't sew on a button. I'm like, don't worry, there's no buttons tonight. So if you're feeling like, this drawing process is beyond what your pencil can do. I uh, say to you, I think you can do this. I really feel strongly that all of us can accomplish this. I'm just taking a sip of tea. Okay, so what we're gonna start with is just making some simple, simple shapes. And by that, I mean, uh, I've made an oval shaped head and then I have a couple of semicircles for ears. Um, this body is just a big oval. You can imagine it's like an egg shape, an egg shape, right? Um, the paws that are coming out are just elongated ovals. And what may look like the trickiest bit maybe are these, uh, the feet at the bottom. And they're really just sort of a cylinder, which is a very common shape that we make in art class. And I'm gonna walk us all through all of it. So here we go. I'm gonna draw pretty dark so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, but I would suggest that you sketch. And often um, I think it's a good idea to practice holding your pencil a little bit different. And dare, dare I say, like, like a, real proper artists. Lots of artists, when they sketch, they'll hold their pencil more like a flute. So if you're right-handed, it might look like that. I would um, say maybe if you're, as you're sketching, if you want to play around with holding your pencil in a different way, go for it. And also I would suggest to you that you audition a shape before you actually lay it down. So what I mean by that is before I actually go uh, pencil to paper, I'm going to move my arm around and I'm drawing with my whole arm here. I can feel my arm moving away from my body. So it's not just something that happens right here at the wrist. It's really my whole body. And this is an, an art tip that I want you to use everywhere you are. So we may be making um, a very sweet and charming bear tonight, but um, when you're out there in the world and you're, you know, making art on your own, I want you to use this technique as well, of drawing with your arm and auditioning a shape. Now, again, I'm going to draw darker so that you can see it at home. 
I would suggest you draw a bit more lightly. So I've got my um, head on here. And as we know, everything here is changeable. So if I don't like how something has turned out, I have the freedom to make some changes. So I've got one half ear, half circle uh, ear, and one over here. You could think about it, maybe it looks like the letter C to you. And I always think about how um, you would teach this to someone else. So if you've got some uh, art, art enthusiast in your life, maybe some little kids or some big grownups, um, and you wanna share the love of art, I always think about how you would teach them. So if you think about this, the simplest shapes, the letter C and then the letter C reversed over there, I'm gonna work on the face in a little bit. I'm gonna go down to the body now. And our body here, you could think about it almost like big parentheses. Um, and notice that I haven't gone all the way to the edge of the paper. I've left some space because I want my bear sitting on a little blanket. Uh, so I am gonna, and again, you can audition your shape before you actually put it down on paper. And you can move your, your paper around so that you're, very, you're more comfortable. I'm not doing that because I don't want to, you know, make you seasick with me moving my paper all over. But um, feel free to move your paper so that you're the most comfortable. All right, and so now I'm going to sketch in where his paws are going to go. And I think I'm gonna sketch the paws before I sketch the heart. So you could have his little paws way up here and that would look very cute. That would look cute in a different way, way down low, you know, he's a lopey bear. Um, the ones I have here are sort of in the center. I'm gonna do that, but feel free to play around and really give a lot of character. So these are just, some ovals and you can see I have them so they don't quite touch because I want us to play around with the idea of layering. Something's in front, something's behind. So they don't quite touch. Okay, and now I'm going to sort of look at where my center is right about here and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put my heart shape in and uh, so again, you can audition the shape. And again, I'm sketching darker so that you can see from where you are. So I've got, if you think about this, this is sort of like the number three, if I just turn this. So again, if you were teaching this to a little, ki little kiddo, you could think about them drawing the number three for the top of our heart. And then trying to get the point of the heart underneath uh, where the, the tip is here. I'm just gonna sketch in the other sides of my heart. You could by all means just draw a heart and then erase back the, the lines. You could absolutely do that. And I have, I have extra lines in here and it's fine. So now these, uh, these legs at the bottom. Uh, if anything, I'm just gonna flip my paper over so I can just sketch a little bit. If you wanna just watch the screen for a moment. Um, so these are just a cylinder. So if I start off with an sort of an oval shape and then a line at the bottom, a line at the top. So th then the it looks very much like um, just one long tube. But what I preferred to do, I kept the line at the bottom straight, but the line at the top, I brought down a little bit. Let's see, I'll do this more dark so that you can. So I brought it sort of down. So the one on the bottom is sort of straight because it's sitting on this blanket. The one at the top, I, I angled it in a little bit. And depending on how you drew your your oval here, you know, if you made it a, a more skinny oval, that would give a different look to the paw, like it's turning a bit. So that may be a new shape for some of us to draw. 
Um, I would say just go for it. Your pencil has an eraser and you're sketching. Um, again, I'm drawing darker so that you can see what's going on. So this goes back and then this one here, I'm tucking down a little bit. And to me, that looks a little bit small for the size of my bear. So I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger. Give him a big old, big old honking leg, big old sturdy gams. And then one over here. And then the hearts that are on his paws, notice that they're actually tilted a little bit, um, just to sort of fit the shape of that paw. And again, this is a, um, a very sweet cartoony drawing these art skills of drawing a cylinder and putting things in front or behind um, this negative shape painting that we're gonna do in a bit, um, they're all really useful exercises to go through for making other, other art that might, you might consider more serious. So I decided I'm gonna put him on a little Afghan. So I just made sort of a, a wiggly line, put him on a soft afghan. And I added uh, little circles here to keep them white, to keep, to remind myself to keep those white because like I wanted to like see through it sort of. And now for the face. Oh, oh, the ears. I also hid some, some hearts in the ears. So I can't see the full heart. It's typically when I draw critters, I give them some sort of pink in their ears. Let's see. Okay, looking good, looking good. Awesome, good job team. I'm just gonna take a sip of tea. Okay, so now looking at my face, this is where you really can have so much fun. There's so many different ways to show expression. I'm just gonna go to my sketch side again. I'm gonna draw out a couple of faces here. So on my sample, I've given him sort of this half sleepy. Um, so if this is his eyeball, I've given him uh, a, is that coming up? I'm giving him a eyelid that's sort of, you know, maybe halfway down and tucking his, his eyeball underneath that eyelid. And it just gives a sort of a dopey or a sleepy or just a very soft kind of look. So here's the eyelid, right? So that's a, a way to go about it. Um, you could do the same thing, give him, but give him less eyelid, so less eyelid and more eye showing. So that's an idea. And you could put the, that he's looking off in a direction if we look at it that way. You can give no eyelid at all. And um, I, so if you're giving no eyelid at all, just be very careful. I wouldn't show the entire iris of the eye. Um, so I would cut off the iris a little bit. Because if when you show the whole iris, like right here, when you show the whole iris, let's see, which is right here, the, the critter just looks a bit freaked out. And maybe that's what you're going for. You're going for startled bear. If you're going for startled bear, 
then very little to no eyelid and bam, right in the center. If you're going for something a little bit more sleepy, then really close that eye down and put a lot of lid like I have on my sample here. I do think it's important that both of the irises are sort of uh, leading to the same direction. So if they're going forward, great. If they're going left or right, great. If you make them look um, like they're splitting the difference, going one's going left, one's going right, or they're both going towards the nose, that gives you a special look as well. So it's just something to recognize with your character. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, again, I'm sketching darker so that you can see what's going on. You can see right now that's a bit frightening just having those big old eyeballs. And I'm gonna give them heavy eyelids again, like Sleepy Bear. And this time I'll make him look in the other direction. Like they're looking at each other. I gave him a, a heart-shaped nose. So kind of a, a softer tip. It wasn't, a, it wasn't pointy like down below. Gave him a heart-shaped nose. And then um, you don't necessarily need to draw this in with your pencil, but if you want to, so for his mouth, it's um, basically the letter Y upside down, but I've curved it. And you, if you've been in other classes where we've drawn critters, um, I just like to once again, point out the magic. So if we look at my screen, do you see how by giving him just an upside down Y, how he just looks very much, Hey Barb, good to see you. We've got everyone muted for now. You can unmute yourself if you like. Um, but for right now, it's good to see the woods are in the house. So for his mouth, see right here. Yes, I've it's been, nice to see you. Sorry. Oh, that's that's great. That's great. Hi, Barb. How are you? Uh, so um, he looks very serious, and he looks very like. A teenager. You've just asked a teenager to, you know, put the dishes away, and that's the face that they gave you. And just the magic of like a eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch of a little upturn on the edges, just gives them such a more of a sweet face, a softer face. But again, it can be whatever, whatever you are feeling. Taking a sip of tea. Okay, my friends, it is time for us to put some color on our art project. So um, as I said, in this kit that you got this month, whoop, um, I've given you black, uh, a medium blue, a pink, uh, really a, a very warm colored brown and a, and a green. But if you've got your other Five from last month, you can use those as well. Uh, I'm trying to mix up the colors so that if you continuously get the kit, you'll have by, you know, in a couple of months, you're gonna have lots of different colors to play with. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the bear, uh, him or herself. And notice we don't have any white in our kit, right? So we're gonna have to make decisions about uh, what's gonna stay white um, before we start laying down a lot of color, like I made sort of a shiny bit on the eyelids. So if we take, ooh, there we are. So you can see his eyelids, I've given him sort of a shiny bit I, by just not putting any marks there. And then you can see it gets darker and lighter uh, moving around the bear to show shading. So um, how you can accomplish that is by, um, not putting marks where you want to keep things white. So now we are coloring. How fun is this? Here we are, a group of individuals coloring together. What joy. So I'm just gonna start having at it. I'm gonna start by outlining my parts here. And again, remember anything you want to keep white, 
don't add any color there because we really can't get back to white once we've made these marks. And in a little bit, we're going to pull out our oil, our baby oil, and get to doing some of that magic we did last time. Or if this is your first time here, you're going to ooh and ah once we start using the baby oil. And one of the things I love about these oil pastels is that you really can't be perfect with them. Just throw that idea of making something that's perfectly perfect, just throw that out the window because you can't do it really with these crayons, right? They're like, these are adult crayons that we're working on with right here. They're, it's wax and oil, uh, binder and pigment. Uh, but you, you're working with a shape that doesn't really have a point on it. You could take a razor blade and sort of file this down, but I'm going to suggest that you just let it be um, soft and malleable as it is. So I've got some outlines going. I'm going to start thinking about where my darks and my lights are. So anywhere that I think something's going to cast a shadow. I'm going to make that darker. So if we look right under our, my bear's chin, it's darker. Around the edges, I've made it a little bit darker. And definitely underneath his paws, I've made it darker. And what really makes this heart look like it's popping out from the paper is the shadowing I've put under the heart. So I'm going to do some of that same uh, technique here. I'm going to add more pigment wherever I think something would cast a shadow. And sometimes I really cheat it. Sometimes I, I really try to make a difference. Like in the, where his head is, I've made lighter than his body because I really want it look, to look like his head is coming forward. We're trying to trick the eye here. And here it's another, um, another idea that will serve you in all sorts of art, that things that are a bit darker are going to fall backwards into your into your scene so it's going to look it's going to have the illusion that it's further away from you and then things that are lighter are going to come forward uh his eyeballs here look like they're more forward than uh the bottom of his belly because the bottom of his belly is darker Every once in a while, turn your oil pastel so that um, you can keep uh, changing where you're getting a surface. That's a, a good tip for if you're a pencil, if you like to use colored pencils, keep turning your colored pencil as you use it and you'll get your tip will remain pointy longer. And again, if you've done a cat or you know some sort of other animal, that by all means, and if you've changed what colors uh, you're using, that's all good too. Remember to keep anything you want white, keep really keep it white. Don't worry about filling in every single um, piece of white paper here. We're gonna use our oils in a little bit and we're gonna start moving this pigment around. I've made the bottoms of his legs darker because um, I feel like they would be hitting the ground and sort of casting a shadow. And you can play with uh, how much pressure you're putting on the oil pastel. Are you making very light strokes or are you making very dark uh, heavy strokes that that's going to change the way that the materials react. Another thing to think about are the directions of your marks. So 
I, I'm on his face right now and I'm going in the direction of the shape. So what I mean by that is um, if this is the shape I'm trying to convey, I'm, I would go around like this or back and forth like this to uh, mimic the shape of his fur, so to speak. If I did cross hatching that was on the diagonal, um, that's just a, gonna be a different look. I'm thinking about the direction of that the shape is taking. What a lovely way for us to spend our time looking at colors, hanging out, thinking about the shape of a teddy bear. That's kind of a fun, interesting, wacky thing to do, I think. I am grateful for it. I always make the uh, underneath the eyes just a little bit darker so that it Again, it gives the feeling that the eyeballs are coming forward a bit, but it also can make your make your creatures look a bit tired or a bit droopy. So use that technique uh, with some caution. If your crayon or your pastel here starts to run out of material, you can always peel back this, um, the packaging that's on it. I like to keep the, as much of the packaging on as I can so that uh, my hand isn't interacting with it because these will get on your hands a bit. They are non-toxic and all of that, but still we don't have to handle it. We don't handle it. Okay, I'm going to leave it here for right now. I'm definitely going to come back and put more color in on the on his face, on his head. But I'm going to going to leave it here for right now, uh, and I'm going to start to play with our cotton swabs and our and our uh, baby oil. This baby oil is going to act to um, help us move the color around and make the color. Um, a little bit more smooth. Uh, if we had more than one color on our page right now, it would blend colors. So that's um, a blessing and a curse. You just have to recognize that you're blending the color. So I've got a little bit of oil on my cotton swab. And now, oh, the magic, the magic. So this is definitely not a project that is uh, what, I would call archival. Archival meaning that the materials are going to last forever. The paper that I've given you is archival and the, um, the, the pastels are quality enough that they're, they're basically archival. And that just means that they're not going to disintegrate as quickly um, as we go along. But the minute we put this baby oil on it, that sort of goes out the window. But that's okay. So if you really want to make this uh, a project that lasts forever, <clears throat> you could use um, some sort of linseed oil or something that you would find in an art store. I just didn't want, I didn't think it was smart to be doling out linseed oil and, um, you know, it's not the safest thing to have around all the time, but baby oil is, is pretty benign. 
So um, with that being said, if you wanted to make this project, you know, you work on this tonight and maybe you work on it for a little while after class and you just think it came out just super great, which I love that uh, idea. Um, <clears throat> go have it scanned at, <clears throat> excuse me, at Staples or uh, take a picture and print the picture. And then you'll have something that will last even longer. You can use your fingers as well. Don't be eating any potato chips right now or popcorn. Wash your hands before you have snacks again. Little bear. And it's interesting, different colors are gonna interact with the oil a little bit differently. So colors that are considered warmer, meaning that they would tend to make you feel more of a warm sensation, yellows, oranges, reds, um, warm colors generally come forward in a scene and cooler colors, so blues, certain kinds of greens, purples, um, cooler colors will recede into uh, a, a painting. So if you were a landscape painter, you would be using that information all the time. You would really be thinking about, um, say you had a landscape painting of a barn on a hill and um, the barn is really far away, but in the foreground, there was a, there were some flowers. The artist would probably make those flowers in the foreground warmer, like, yellows and oranges and reds and maybe make the barn have a cooler hue maybe gray or a blue or even a cooler red because each each color can be cool or warm some combination um cooler colors are always going to look like they are far farther away from you just a a trick of the eye because what we're doing is, you know, we're trying to trick people here. We are using what's basically a two-dimensional surface, two-dimensional surface. And by using these techniques of shading um, and maybe some color manipulation, we are trying to pretend like something is actually in 3D. By me putting this extra shading under the heart and under the paws, it'll make the paws look like they're coming forward and that the belly here is going backwards in space, but really that's not happening. When that first started happening in art in let's say the 1500s, the late 1400s, the 1500s into the 1600s, when that's when people started to recognize um, perspective, it was, it was a thing. People would walk into a church and look at a painting that had perspective in it and it was said that people would get woozy and they would sort of, you know, lose their balance because they couldn't understand what they were seeing. And, you know, now we have high def TV. And, <laughs> but uh, back when um, painters and illustrators were first really understanding what, um, how you can manipulate color and shape and shading, it really was, was uh, revolutionary at the time. I have to share my um, sons had when they were growing up had um, video games like a Sega Genesis and other types of things and mm -hmm. that me but um, anyways when they were doing that they would play these games and some of the early ones were more 2D than 3D sure when they got to the 3D ones like the Mario Kart and all that type of stuff 
I had a terrible time playing those games with them. The 2D ones, I was okay, but the 3D ones, nope, that made me dizzy, just like you're talking about. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. And and how do you feel now, now that you've seen them more? Do you have that same effect on you? I'm not certain. Um, they are, they're gone and grown and out of the house and I don't gotcha. interact with those things very much anymore. But I think I'm I'm more in tune with 3D stuff, but I think it's, for me, it was more of a um, something I wasn't very used to. They obviously grew up with those things. So for them, that is like second nature. And right. so I think that's the same thing with um, young um, children and whatnot. They grow up with more of those 3D image things. Um, and so for them, it's like, nope, this is the norm. So it, yeah. it have to do, yeah. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. I remember when those IMAX movies first came out, those big, big screens like would wrap around a whole, like the whole building practically. Um, I took my Auntie Val to see one of the movies and she hadn't been to the movies in a long time. And, and uh, she actually, like we had to leave the theater because it was so much information. It was so realistic. <laughs> we went to see like panda bears hanging out in a, in a in a forest or something um and again it was a benign uh subject matter but it was the 3d aspect of it was so overwhelming for her we had to leave the theater uh so she just wasn't used to it cute 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 so feel free to start moving into other colors whatever you're feeling um, again, think about if something's going to have an area where it looks lighter, like my heart here, I've given it a little shine bubble on one side. Uh, and how I did that was just by not painting or using my, my tools in that area so that it looks a little bit lighter. And again, I'm making where his paw would be on top of the Valentine, on top of the heart. I'm making that pink more intense so that it really looks like the paw is in front. And then I'm gonna move it around in the ears. And I'm moving it, moving it around in the nose and I'm definitely leaving a space in the nose that looks shiny. So I'm really being careful that I'm not coloring in the entire nose uh, with that pink. And I'll soften it a little bit, you know, either with my finger or with when I get to the oil. Cute, cute, cute. Again, feel free to move your paper um, in, you know, keep turning it around if that makes it feels better. Uh, I don't want to do that because I don't want anyone to, you know, get seasick as I'm, as I'm drawing here. I am gonna, let's see, I'm gonna do some more brown and then I'm definitely gonna put some cheeks in. And I like when you see some of the texture. I don't, you don't have to smooth out every little mark that you make. Seeing some of the texture is quite nice as well. You see once that oil sort of dries down, you can go in with more marks. It's nice to really see the human hand in all of this, that a human created this. Right before Christmas, I did a, an artist event, uh, like a vendor mall kind of artist event. 
And uh, to keep myself busy during the event, uh, I was coloring in, in, in the coloring book I produced, my Bunsies Bandalas. And the best thing that was said to me all day, like people were very kind and, you know, people had purchasing my art and it was very kind, but the, the nicest thing that was said to me all day was a little kid came up and looked at my coloring in book and he said, you color really good. <laughs> and I just thought that was the greatest compliment from a little kiddo. So I'm going to go in with my black here and give myself some more shading, like where this paw is. underneath the heart a little bit. Just to set in the ears. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the black to make his mouth here. And again, don't worry about being perfect with these, the, these pastels, these oil pastels. Um, you kind of can't be super perfect all the time because of the shape of them. So I, I see that as a, a blessing. It really frees you up, I think. And you see, you can move this around with your fingers as well. And the paper I've given you, so the brand is called Canson. I like this paper because it's easy to find. Here, let's see. So this is the paper that you have in front of you. Um, it's this Canson watercolor. Um, and so the important thing here when you're looking at paper is this pound. So 140 pounds, that means a ream of this paper weighs 140 pounds versus something that may weigh like 96 pounds or 98 pounds. Um, so uh, you'd get less sheets of paper uh, with in this ream because it weighs more, but you have heavier paper and it really can take a lot of uh, manipulation. So that's what you've got in your kit right now. It's easy to find it at Markle's, Markle's, <laughs> Michael's, <laughs> Markle's. Um, and I was talking about things being, um, let's see, focus. Can I get that to focus? So I was, so it's my camera isn't focusing, but what that says is acid free. It says acid free on the paper, meaning that it's less likely to deteriorate quickly versus like newspaper. Newspapers aren't meant to be around for very long. That's why they yellow and they, they wither. But this acid-free paper is meant to uh, have a bit more longevity. But the way I look at it, like we're not acid-free ourselves, right? So um, I, I don't get too concerned. But I, I do like this Canson paper a lot and it's almost exclusively what I use um, so it's almost exclusively what I use for my notebooks, for my uh, sketchbooks. So you can see this is my mixed, this is mixed media. It's the same brand, Canson, uh, but this is only 98 pounds for a ream. So it's not as heavy as the watercolor paper. And they're, they're just a little bit different. The watercolor paper is more purpley blue and the mixed media is more tealy blue. Again, and often Michaels will have, you know, you buy one and you get one for 50% off. The bigger the pad, the cheaper per inch the paper is, but you can get little, little small little ones that you can like drop in your bag or your purse. 
not sponsored. Hey, Canson, you should sponsor us at the library. <laughs> Right. So I'm moving on to these eyelids here. And again, I'm going to give him sort of a shiny spot. And don't worry about yours looking like mine. Yours should look like yours. We're, we're not trying to get to a point here where we hold these up and we have, you know, 14 identical bears. I want each one of you to have your own little things that you do, your own styles, your techniques. So as I said before, I think the one place where you do want to take a moment uh, before you rush into it is when you're putting the eyes in. Because we really can't get back to white from here, um, if, you make, if you make a mark with your pastel, we're not gonna really be able to get it off of the paper here. So really make sure that you have a good plan for what your, your, the irises of your eyes are gonna be doing if they're gonna be looking in one direction or another. Um, all answers are correct. Just this is one place you do want to be really um, taking your time. So drop your shoulders, don't hold your breath, don't hold your breath. Uh, I'm gonna use my blue and I'm gonna start off with small marks so that uh, if something happens, if I get earthquake hands suddenly and I, like make a weird mark, it's gonna be okay. So apologize if you, if you get the back of my head for a moment. I'm even gonna take my glasses off. Ooh, you know she means business when she takes her glasses off. So just really take your time to get your eyes doing what you want them to do. Again, I like to leave a little white in the eyes, a little glint, a little hopeful glint that we all appreciate. And I can go in with my, yeah, not bad. They don't need to be twins, but they should certainly be cousins, right? Like for any of us who pluck our eyebrows, we don't need twin eyebrows. We just need eyebrows that look like they're going to the same party. So that's the same thing I think when, uh, <clears throat> when I'm making eyeballs. So I've got some blue in here and now I'm going to be careful. And Here's a good pro tip. So I'm a left-handed person most of the time. So I am going to um, put oil on these eyeballs from right to left so that uh, I don't smear. If I do the left one first, dab, 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 and then go over to the right one, there's a high likelihood of me smearing it. So what I'm gonna do is do the right one first and then go over to the left and then by the time I go on to something else, that will be dryish. So I would su suggest that for you, uh, go towards whatever is not your dominant hand or flip your paper the other direction so that you are not likely to smear. So I'm just doing short little choppy hits with my oil. Bada bing. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Cracks me up. I love my life. <laughs> this is this is what I'm here for. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna let that dry down a little. That oil will dry down a little bit. Um and I'm feeling like I want to put in his little blankie here underneath. So I'm going to use the blue here. And I'm going to throw in his little blanket. I'm going to avoid those white circles I made because I'm kind of thinking of it like 
you know, an Afghan or a doily or something. And I'm gonna make the color of the blankie more intense underneath the bear. So where he's sitting, interacting, he's gonna be casting a shadow. So that area is gonna be darker for sure. And then I'm gonna lighten up as I move out towards the edges. And then you can use whatever colors you want, any design you want. Maybe you want it to look like um, it's got granny squares on it. And oh, always grab a clean um, cotton swab. So I wouldn't go in with my this brown right now. So a little bit of color theory coming at you. So this brown is very close to the orange range on our on our color wheel. Orange and blue are complementary colors. We if I whip out my color wheel. Um, so orange and blue are complementary colors. You can see like that the color of the bear looks very close to orange. So if when they sit next to each other and they're dry, they make each other pop even more than they would on their own. And that's why I specifically chose a blue blanket under it, the bear. Um, that's great when they're dry, when they are wet and they start to mix, you're going to get mud. So, oh, I just... So um, those of you who are new here, welcome to a little bit of color theory. So our, uh, red and blue, red and green are opposite ends of the color wheel. So here's my color wheel, here's green. The farthest away from green is red. So they're complementary colors. Um, so they look really cool when they're next to each other, but when they mix, so here I've got 100% green, and 100% red. And then when I smush them, when I get those wet colors mixed, I get a neutral. So this is some sort of middle brown, um, depending on your camera, maybe coming up differently. So complementary colors are great when they are sitting next to each other and they are dry. When they smush, when they, they get together, they create something completely different. And maybe that's what you're looking for, but maybe it's not. So something, it, it's it more important to know uh, what's going on. Uh, what, so when, as you're making decisions about uh, what colors you're putting in different places, then to be surprised. You know, and that is going to be true, not just here in, in oil pastel worlds that we're in, but in everything that you do. So if you're a person who dyes their hair and if you have uh, bright, golden yellow hair and you put purple hair dye on your yellow hair, you're gonna get some sort of grayed out silvery look. And maybe that's what you're going for, but maybe it's not. It's all about um, color mixing and how colors interact with one another. I'm just smushing this blue around, avoiding my little white spots showing some textures and letting some of these lines show through because it's cool and interesting. It's a good idea to have your art be interesting uh, from across the room and up close. Like if someone were on the other side of a gallery and they saw your artwork, they say, oh, that looks really interesting. I'm going to invest my energy to walk all the way around across the gallery to go look at your art piece. Give them something to be surprised by. Little marks, little surprises that you can't see unless you're really on top of it. Oh my gosh, it's cute. So now to me, it looks like I lost some of that shadow. So I'm just gonna throw some more shadow down here. Make some marks. Ah, it's cute.
And I, I'm not sure if it's coming up on camera for you, but if you see how I've left his muzzle lighter than his face, it should have this effect where it looks like the muzzle, his nose area, his mouth is coming forward a little bit because it is darker. I'm sorry, it is lighter than the area around it. And then the same thing where the head casts a shadow on the body by really pushing that shadow, really making it exaggerated. It tr tricks the eye into thinking that um, it is closer or farther away, depending on if you're looking at the shadow or the highlights. And it's really what these, this is meant to elevate your art technique by just investigating these, these principles of shadow and light. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's cracking me up. Okay, so I would like some cheeks. I always like a little rosy cheek in my critters. Um, it's another one of those things that you sort of wanna think about the placement. So I'm dropping in some pink. Smushing it. It's just sweet. I've added some little directional lines here, just around his muzzle. So like open parentheses here and close parentheses, just to really bring that muzzle forward. And we're working from imagination right now. We are just, so you have the sample here. You can see where we're going towards, but we're working from our imagination. Um, if you wanted to do this study again, put out a, a stuffed animal, whatever it is that you have, you know, stuffed cat, mouse, whatever you have, and um, set it up, put some lighting on it so that it definitely has a lighter side and a darker side, and just draw what you see. The best way to become better at your art is by looking more and looking better. Not that you look better. I do think you look better the more you like art, but 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 seeing more, seeing better. That's um, practice and and practice looking. Practice the actual thing, but then practice looking at things. The more you do that, the more you're eleve you're going to elevate your art practice. Okay, so the last. A major area right now is our background. And oh, as I said, yes. I've got to leave you with my hands. So I'll finish the with the video. Excellent. Happy birthday, Ruth. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, so the next area is um our background. And I thought it would be nice to practice um uh some negative shape painting or drawing or crayon, crayoning, pastelling, <laughs> all of those words. Um, so I'm going to drop hearts in the background. I, I like when my, um, my critters have some sort of background behind them, like a wallpaper. You could absolutely leave it just white here or all one solid color, but um, I think it would look sweet. And it's a good thing to practice and to know, put it, put it in your art arsenal. Um, and you notice I didn't make them all the same shape. I didn't trace, um, you know, you could get your, make yourself a little template or something uh, and trace a bunch of parts, but I think going for it and winging it is a good idea as well. So I'm gonna start, um, I like this one that's right above his head. I think that's quite cute and clever. So I'm gonna start, just drawing in some hearts wherever I feel like it. I'm making them various sizes. 
sometimes they're just sneaking up behind our bear friend. You don't see the entire heart. Don't worry about them being perfect. Being, being purposefully random, which which can sometimes be harder than <laughs> than having a you know a pattern that is re repeatable. You really do have to sort of get them all in now because, like I said, we can't really get back to this white paper. So by planning them now, can change up the sizes a little bit. So what we just drew are the positive shapes, the positive shape. We could say that before we drew in that those hearts, we could say that the positive shape was our bear on his blankie and the negative shape was everything around the bear. So now by us defining these heart areas, we are saying that the hearts for this part, the background, the hearts are our positive shape and we're going to be coloring in everything that isn't a heart around the bear. So in design, you're always uh, thinking about how shapes interact with one another. So not just the shape itself, but what's happening around the shape. What shape is the, what is your positive shape affecting in the background? Um, you're always thinking about that. I'm trying to, I'm just looking around the studio to see. So for instance, in this painting I've been working on, so our major positive shape is the mouse. Focus, please. Focus, focus, thank you. Um, the major shape is this, is this white mouse, right? And I put this curly Q tail above his head so that I get this extra shape, this extra shape right here where this turquoise is above his head, just to add extra interest. So when, when you're thinking about the positive shapes, you are inevitably also thinking about the negative shape. Um, so now I'm just coloring uh, background. I'm gonna color down here to And it's totally fine if you don't finish your creation tonight. You know, th this sample that I made, I did over a couple of sessions. I typically, uh, most of my art isn't one and done, isn't I just sit down and start to finish, get, get it all to where I want it to be. And again, the baby oil is gonna allow us to smush this around. But you could leave it just big and choppy like this too. That's nice to have that contrast that our bear has mostly been smoothed out by the oil. So you could leave this background just kind of choppy. That might look nice too. Little um, change up the pattern a little bit. Again, our next class here, so if anyone else needs to leave, to, um, our next class is going to be on March 16th, Wednesday, March 16th. So um, I'll have, same thing will happen. I'll have the kits and Jenny or Emma or someone from the library will uh, send out an email. 
we're going to continue on. So all year we're going to be working with these oil pastels and each month I'm going to sort of add another set of um, ideas into your, um, your art toolkit. So like right now we're looking at negative and positive shapes. We didn't really do that that much last month. So now I'm just going around and zhuzhing things up, adding extra layers, pushing the shadows more than they were. Now I've had art teachers tell me that you should always be moving around your art piece. You shouldn't stay in one spot. And then I've had art teachers who say, finish one spot before you go on to the next. So I don't know, do, do whatever feels better. I like to, get my major components all down, my major ideas, and then go back and look at them. So um, taking a picture of your artwork will really teach you a lot about the piece. So um, if you wanted, you take a picture of your thing and then look at that picture and you're going to see things that maybe you didn't see before. You could change the direction of your art piece and maybe that will point out something that you didn't see before and it really is a real tried and true art technique to squint at your artwork because when you squint you sort of minimize how many tones you're seeing you'll only really see the very light tones and the very dark tones the shadows and the highlights and by squinting you may notice something um, that you didn't notice when you're using your full eyeballs. And again, that works with whatever you're working on. So if you're working with oil colors or uh, watercolors, oil paints or watercolors, squinting at your artwork, or if you're just using pen, if you're using a big pen and a post-it note, that um, squinting at your artwork will work uh, wonders to educate you about what maybe something you need to add. I'm gonna... All right, I am, I am going to um, call mine done for now. I'm going to stop recording.